Hey, fellowship family and friends, welcome to the month of June. I, I can just tell you, man, we are coming off of an incredible May where over 30 people have given their life and faith to Jesus at our in-person services and no telling how many people at our online gathering. But now we've rolled into June and I can just tell you, we're going to do baptism for all of these new believers on Father's Day, June the 20th. So if you need to go through the waters of baptism, we invite you to be a part of this special gathering on Sunday, June the 20th. Now, here's what I'm praying for June. I pray it is the greatest June of your life. Here's why, because I just believe that God has a great plan for your life and he is so good to us. So remember what God said in Jeremiah chapter 29. I know it's a verse, you've probably seen it on a coffee mug or on a t-shirt. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Well, today, that's our prayer for you. And we're believing God for great things. So we're going to sing today. We're going to pray today. We're going to worship today. We're going to encourage you today. We're going to learn from the Word of God today as we honor the King of Kings together. Well, we're in Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, so grab your Bible, open up the Bible app, whichever one you would prefer, and have a pen or a notepad ready to go. We're going to learn from God's Word today as we've been exploring verse by verse through this Gospel. Man, it's been amazing so far, and we pray that today is just as incredible. Now, I'm going to ask, if you would, just remove any distractions. I like the phrase, clear the calculator, so that we can be present in this moment with full attention on the Word of God. And I'm going to ask that you just hear the Word of God today. Take a deep breath as we get started today. Let me pray for us. Father, we come to you in this moment. Would you meet us at our point of need just as you did your disciples and those who followed and listened and were a part of the experience in the first century of seeing you perform these miracles. And we're asking today, would you do something unique and special in our lives at the online gathering, as well as at our in-person gathering today? We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friend, as we've been going through the gospel of Mark, verse by verse, where we left off was Jesus had had this very large crowd of people that had gathered, and he went out and taught them from the boat, and then we, we began to discover how he said to his followers, you know what, let's go to the other side of the lake. And they question him, why? We've got all these people that want to hear from you. He's like, yeah, but we got ministry on the other side of the lake. They get out in the middle of the lake. This huge storm overwhelms them. We talked about it a few weeks ago. And then as it all calms down, they row their way to the other side and they land in the land of the Gerasenes. As soon as they step ground on the land of the Gerasenes, this crazy man, because this is... This is a region that is so pagan, they don't have synagogues, there are no Old Testament scriptures being read, and this crazy demon-possessed man comes running up to Jesus, and when he encounters Jesus, friend, just like you, just like me, when we encounter him, our lives are radically changed. He moves from being a guy that's screaming in the cemeteries to proclaiming the gospel in his city. How cool is that? So Jesus and his disciples, they get back in the boat. They're going to go back to the other side. Man, all that happened in one day from the storm at night to the demon-possessed man out in the uh, region of the Gerasenes to back in the boat. And guys, let's row back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And as they approach, guess what? There's another huge crowd of people that have gathered, man. Maybe they didn't even leave from... 24 hours earlier. Maybe there's, they've been camping out. I, I don't know. It just says, the scriptures say there was a large group of people that had gathered on the seashore. Jesus performed some miracles, but the ministry has become overwhelming. There's so many needs to be met. So here's what Jesus does. He says, you know what, guys? It's time to put it into action. What you've seen me do, what you've witnessed me do, now I need you to do it. And so he sends the disciples out two by two to put into practice what they've been taught. And, and this allows some of the weight of the ministry to be taken off of him, although he continues to minister, but so do his disciples. So now they've been able to multiply their efforts. This was the first time we've seen it, 
uh, in chapter 6 where the disciples actually are doing some of the similar miracles that Jesus was doing. People are being healed, demons being cast out. And so as Jesus sent them out in this two-by-two format, uh, they may not have even understood why he was doing this, but Jesus understood this is missional training because it wouldn't be long the church was going to be established and started, and these guys were going to be key components to launching the New Testament church. Now, we know that these faithful followers, uh, as they do this ministry, they are feeling overwhelmed as well. They are hungry. They are tired. And when they all came back together after casting out demons and healing people, they all come back together in hunger and being fatigued, they need a little break. And this is where we're going to pick up the story today from Mark chapter 6, verse number 30. The disciples in Jesus are tired and hungry. And here's what the scriptures say starting in verse number 30. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, hey guys, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. So, in other words, let's, let's just get away. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they, le so they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now let's press pause right there. This has been the theme of his ministry. Everywhere he goes, large crowds are gathering. People are coming from all over. They want to see him. They want to hear from him. They, they are mesmerized by his authoritative teaching. They've seen him do these incredible miracles and heal people. And they just want a little piece of this. They want to experience Jesus, and so there's no wonder these large crowds have gathered. But they're tired. Jesus and his, and his friends, they were on their way for a little R&R. &R. They needed a little bit of rest. But Jesus, when he steps out of the boat, he recognizes with compassion that the people need him. See, compassion, it, it, that's different than being concerned. Compassion is that feeling inside of us that, I'm compelled to just have to do something about it. I have to address the situation now. And as Jesus scans the crowd, the scriptures say he's moved with compassion because the people are like a sheep. They're wandering around out in the field and they don't have a leader. So let's pick it up and see what happens. At the end of verse 34, he said, so Jesus moved with compassion, this large crowd of people, what does he do? He begins teaching many things. Now late in the afternoon, verse 35, his disciples came to him and they said, this is a remote place, Jesus. I mean, it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to, buy, go to the nearby farms and villages and there they can buy something to eat. And Jesus said, you feed them. Well, with what, they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. Well, how much bread do you have? Jesus asked. Go and find out. And they came back and they reported. Well, Jesus, we've got five loaves of bread and two fish. Then Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. So they've got five loaves of bread... And they got two fish. Here they are. Oh, man, they got two of these guys. Two of these big fish. And they're going to feed 5,000 plus people with this? I mean, the disciples are like, we don't get it. So Jesus took the five loaves and the fish. And the scriptures say that he raised them up towards his Father in heaven. And looking up to heaven, he blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterward, the, afterward 
the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish. A total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. I mean, this is an incredible story, isn't it? This is an incredible miracle. Now, here's what I like to do. I just believe that one of the most powerful ways for us to understand something like this is to kind of put ourselves into the story. I mean, think about it. 5,000 men plus families. Is it safe to say that this was a crowd of at least 10,000? Maybe 15? Maybe some commentators say probably in excess of 20,000 people. They've, they've left behind their normal daily activity because it is so important to them that they want to hear and see Jesus. And before there was ever the miracle of food multiplication, we saw the humanity of Jesus. He was tired. His friends were tired. Everybody was hunger, hungry. And in verse number 30, he said, Hey, guys, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and when we do, we can rest for a little while. Now, what about you, man? You ever been tired? You ever been at that point where, man, the, the weight of life, the fatigue of life is just wearing you down? What is it that you do to get away? Maybe, maybe your getaway is a spa day. Maybe your day is a, a day trip over to the beach or a quick weekend trip to the beach. Or maybe, maybe you like to just stay home and pull the shades down, grab a good book and a hot cup of coffee or a good tea. Maybe you like to lay in a hammock or... Maybe you're a binge watcher and you just like to pull up Netflix and just kind of get away. I mean, we all have moments like this, seasons like this, where we feel the fatigue and being tired. I can tell you that today actually marks my 11th anniversary as a senior pastor. Now, I was a student pastor for almost two decades before this. And I can tell you, after almost 30 years of doing ministry, there are times where the demands of ministry are just challenging. I mean, it's like you go through seasons where it is go, 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 go. I mean, and the needs of the sheep or the church, the needs of the congregation become so demanding that sometimes you just set aside your own personal rest or food or exercise or your own physical well-being to meet the needs of these people. I can just tell you that's the life of a pastor, a shepherd. And this is where Jesus is. He and the disciples have been doing ministry. They've been giving and giving and giving, and they are exhausted. And so on their way to a local B&B &B to get a little R&R, &R, Jesus is overwhelmed with compassion for the people that are in need. It shows us his human side. But it's not just his human side that we see in this. We also see his God side. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 4, I'm going to read this for you. Jesus said to the devil in a moment of temptation when he was hungry and tired, he had gone out into the wilderness, Jesus said to him, listen, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, Jesus knew that the people, they needed the word. They, he's been teaching. They've embraced it. They love his teaching. Man, he teaches with authority. But he's also God, and he recognizes that they have a need that's physical as well as spiritual. See, that's the God side of him. He's all-knowing. It's called omniscience. And the same goes for you, friend. He knows your need, and he is willing to meet you at your point of need. He's been teaching for weeks. The people want to hear what he has to say, but he knows they've got a physical need. And on this day, they're not going to hear what they need to hear as that stomach is starting to hurt from hunger pains. Now, he not only meets the needs of them, but he pours out lavishly on them. The scriptures say here in chapter 6 that everyone gets all that they want, and then there's 12 baskets left over. Now, something else I want you to just consider from this passage that I think is, is really critical for us to see is that we see the humanity, we see the God side, but I want to make sure that you don't leave today without understanding this principle from what Jesus is teaching us, is that Jesus can take what you have and he can use it to bless many people. See, I love this part of the story. What seems like just a little, five loaves of bread, two fish, it's not much. There's 
uh, 5,000, 10,000, 15, perhaps 20,000 people. I mean, there's a lot of people. And what seems like just a little, I mean, this isn't enough food to feed 100 people, let alone thousands and thousands. But Jesus is teaching us a really great principle here, that he can take just a little and he can wrap that into something that is so significant that it becomes a blessing to so many. Church, I want to make sure that you grab this. You need to know that you may have uh, similar gifts, but you may be gift, gifted and skilled very different than somebody else in the body of Christ. You may look at somebody else and go, man, I'm not as skilled as them, or I'm not as gifted as them. Listen, it's not about how much skill and gift you've got. It's about what you do with what you do have. See, Jesus is able to take a little and multiply it into something great. What is it that he could do with you? Because the power of God is amazing. What if you stepped out in faith and this day became a launching point for you to say, you know what, I may not have the same skills or gifts as this person or that person, but God, here's what I do have. God, I've got a little. I'm going to trust you to take my little and multiply it. God, do what you want to do. Did, did you know that it could have been very easy for Jesus to just pass over all of this? They were headed to a retreat spot. He could have just looked at the people with the eyes of concern and just said, you know what? Man, I see it. I'll be back tomorrow. Or, hey, see you guys on Monday. But he didn't. That compassion compelled him to get out of the boat. Rather than go to the retreat day, Mark records for us that he gets out of the boat and he meets a physical as well as a spiritual need. Now, you, you need to know this about Mark chapter 6. This is on the backside of Jesus getting some really tough news. He's just found out that his buddy John the Baptist has been killed. Herod had him beheaded. So imagine the grief the emotional trauma Jesus is feeling. He's tired. He's hungry. They've been going at it, and now the news of John's death has landed on him. He hears about his buddy. And in this moment of deep grief, Jesus is able to move beyond his own personal needs to meet the needs of others. Think about it. You and I have a Savior. We have a king in Jesus, that although he experiences pain and he has hunger and he gets fatigued, he still meets the needs of his sheep. That's us. So don't dismiss this. Don't miss out on God's ability to do what only he can do. We call it supernatural. See, we're programmed to be self-sufficient. We're programmed that, hey, we'll just take things into our own hands. We'll pull up our bootstraps and we'll tighten the belt and we'll just get after it and we'll work a little harder. And sometimes we just forget that it's Christ and in Him alone when the needs are met and that's when the miracles take place. I can remember early on in my parenting uh, when we first had our, our first little girl and I can remember her looking at me one day and saying something like, Dad, I'm a big girl now. I can do it. I can do it all by myself, Dad. See, the irony of that is that although she may have said that many times and all of our children said it at some point, they still needed their mother and their father. They needed us. I mean, at one and a half, two years old, they're not feeding themselves. They're not going out and working to put food on the table and cooking. They still needed their father. They weren't even able to dress themselves. They needed their father. Putting her into a high chair or helping her brush her teeth. No matter how many times we think, I got this, God. I'm a big boy now. God, I can take care of this. Man, we still need our Father. And that's who Jesus is. We often think we can do it on our own. But He knows what our needs are. And this is the story of God's plan of redemption. He knows what we need. We need a Savior. We need forgiveness of sin. And he gets right to the point. See, Jesus knows that five loaves of bread and two fish, it's not sufficient to feed 5,000 or more people. 
By the way, the people aren't even expecting to be fed this day. But it's at this moment that Jesus shows up and shows out. See, friend, that's when we're in need, when we're at that point where we need him, he is strongest. And Jesus not only meets the needs, but then as the disciples walk around with baskets, they're able to fill up 12 baskets full of food. How many disciples were there? 12. Listen, let me illustrate it this way. They, uh, they grab 12 baskets and they're able to fill up 12 baskets with food and fish. Man, I got some good little sardines in here. They got all kinds of fish. And man, they are having a nice meal. Woo, that smells wonderful. Friends, you and I need to know that There was so much left over. There was more left over than they even started with. See, that's how Jesus is. He meets us at our point of need, and he takes care of us. Let me get some of that fish oil off my fingers. That's how Jesus works. Twelve baskets full of food for twelve hungry ministers. See, he didn't forget the needs of his closest friends. He met the needs of the crowd at large, but also the intimacy of his close friends. And you and I have a need. Our need is Jesus. And it begins with salvation. It begins with knowing that we need a Savior. Friend, you and I are lost. We're dead in our trespass and our sin is what the Scriptures say. And it's Jesus who has come. He lived on this earth for about 33 years and did not know sin until the day he went to the cross. And it's there that he took our sin on him. He died in our place. The Bible says there's a wage for our sin and it's death. And Jesus became our substitute, dying for us. So I can just tell you, friend, the first need we have is a need that is spiritual. Salvation. If you don't know Jesus, man, today, pray something like this. God, today I need you. I know I'm a sinner. And I believe at this very moment that Jesus died on a cross for me. So God, forgive me. I accept what Jesus has done as my only way into right relationship with you. Jesus, save me. I give you my life today. I believe you died. I believe you were buried. And I believe you rose again. And I'm giving you my life today. So that's the first step. A spiritual need, but there's also a physical need. Friend, daily we need Him. And He invites us into this personal relationship because He knows us better than we know ourselves and He can meet the needs that we have. So we need God because He can give us eternal life. But it's even more than that. He gives us the needs of our life. He forgives sin. He sends the Holy Spirit to be our helper. He gives us the power of his grace. He gives wisdom. He protects us. He makes us into something new to be more like him. He allows us to be in right standing. He fills us with peace, church. We don't breathe without him. We don't think and act without him. We don't speak and communicate apart from him. We can't even be awakened to tomorrow's sunrise without him. You and I, we can't love without first understanding that he loved us first. And we can't know a peace apart from him. We need him every single hour, every single minute of every single day. We need him. So today, church, I hope that you see this is more than just a miracle of food multiplication. This is a process of which Jesus is teaching us the significance of meeting our needs, both physically and spiritually, and taking what is just a little And multiplying it, I mean, think about it. Twelve baskets of food are left over. That's more than what they began with. So what's your need today? Quit trying so hard. Just lean in on Jesus. Put your faith in Him. And let the supernatural take place. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for those who have been a part of this gathering today. May we encounter you in a super fresh way. 
God, I, I know I'm not the greatest communicator. I'm not the greatest leader. But God, you've equipped me to pastor this church and to shepherd this church. So God, would you multiply the efforts? Would you multiply the gifts and the skills you've blessed me with and our team with so that there can be exponential fruit? God, we pray that this message goes out today and many people will be encouraged and pointed to the cross. For that person that doesn't know you, may today they come to know you. And for those who are believers already, may today be a time where they recognize my little can become much in the hands of God. And we'll thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I want to say to you, thank you so much. It has been an extraordinary May, and I look forward to an extraordinary June with you. Reach out to us if you're giving your life to Jesus. We'd love to walk with you. And if you want to go through the waters of baptism, then we would love to have you join us and be a part of that special day. So thanks for being a part of this. Like us, follow us on social media, and we'll look forward to being back as we continue in the book of Mark next week. I'll see you next week. Have an amazing week this week. You are loved by God. See you next week.